Angry exchanges in the Commons as MPs debate standards and sleaze. The Prime Minister is running scared. Yeah. When required to lead, he's chosen to hide. Boris Johnson sidestepped the showdown, visiting a hospital instead and refusing to apologise for the growing row. Will you apologise for the way you, you dealt with the Owen Paterson and Parliamentary Standards Affair last week? So, what we've got to make sure is that we, we take all this very, very seriously and that we, we get it right. Also tonight, an independent inquiry is launched into how a double murderer abused at least 100 corpses in seismic change. A dramatic rescue is underway in the Brecon Beacons with an injured caver trapped deep underground. And... How a Strictly star has transformed the way we all see sign language. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. The fury about sleaze allegations levelled against the government took centre stage in Parliament today, with Boris Johnson accused of trashing democracy. It follows the attempt to block Owen Paterson's suspension and to overhaul standards rules. Sir Keir Starmer said the Prime Minister was running scared. The PM himself was absent from the Commons. A no-show at the debate, Mr Johnson had earlier offered no apology for the events which had prompted it. Our political correspondent at Romilly Weeks reports. If the government hoped the Owen Paterson affair could be swept away along with the autumn leaves, recent headlines proof that this crisis is only getting deeper for the Tories, with an uncomfortable spotlight being shone on sleaze every passing day. The Prime Minister himself decided not to attend today's emergency debate on standards. He found a pressing engagement 300 miles away. So will you apologise for the way you, you dealt with the Owen Paterson and Parliamentary Standards Affair last week? So what we've got to make sure is that we, we take all this very, very seriously and that we, we get it right. And there's a, there's a debate today. Unfortunately, I can't be there because I'm, I have a long-standing engagement up here. To be clear, Prime Minister, you're not going to apologise for the way you acted last uh, week? Look, I think it's very important that we get this right and uh, we are going to make every effort to get it right and we are going to hold MPs to account. His absence provoked anger in the Commons. He does not even have the decency to come here either to defend what he did or to apologise for his actions. Rather than repairing the damage that he's done, the Prime Minister is running scared. When required to lead, he's chosen to hide. Yeah. Half-empty Tory benches showed much of the party couldn't stomach the debate either. Discomfort written across the faces of those who did. I would like first and foremost to express my regret and that of my ministerial colleagues over the mistake made last week. We recognise that there are concerns across the House over the standards system and also the process by which possible breaches of the Code of Conduct are investigated. Even though Owen Paterson has now resigned, the repercussions of the affair are reverberating through politics. Labour are demanding an investigation into how Randox, one of the companies employing Mr Paterson, came to be awarded lucrative Covid contracts. Separately, the SNP have asked the police to look at allegations that Tory donors are being rewarded with seats in the House of Lords. And Boris Johnson has his own problems to deal with, renewed questions being asked over the refurbishment of his Downing Street flat and his holiday at a Marbella villa owned by the Tory minister, Zach Goldsmith. The speaker, who's called the episode a dark day for politics, has urged MPs to find cross-party agreement on how to reform the standards process. The only consensus so far is anger at the mess politicians find themselves in. Romilly Weeks, ITV News. And our political editor, Robert Peston, is in the House of Parliament for us now. Rob Robert, there, there's a lot of noise about all this, isn't there, with the PM coming in for particular criticism. How much long-term damage is do done, do you think? 
Well, look, I've been sitting in the press gallery watching this debate, and one of the most striking things is not a single MP, not a single Tory MP, stood up to say that Owen Paterson hadn't breached the rules on lobbying, a breach that the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, described as corrupt and indeed worse than that for the government. A number of Tory MPs, including those who sit on the Standards Committee, which passed judgment on Owen Paterson, very robustly defended the decision uh, that they took to find Owen Paterson guilty. And the most senior Tory, the so-called father of the House, Peter Bottomley, said that the current system did not need reforming, which totally flies in the face of what Boris Johnson and his senior ministerial colleagues argued last week when they forced their MPs against all parliamentary precedent to vote to, to try and change that system and indeed to try and get Owen Paterson off the hook. In many people's minds in the country, what they remember from the 1990s is the phrase Tory sleaze. They are reminded of that in this episode. So, yes, I think this will be very damaging, potentially long term damaging for Boris Johnson. OK, Robert Peston in Parliament. Thank you. Now, the government has announced an independent inquiry into how a double murderer was able to abuse corpses in hospital morgues. David Fuller abused at least 100 bodies over 12 years while working as a hospital electrician. He's also admitted killing two women in 1987. Our health editor, Emily Morgan, has the details. There are very few words to describe the actions of this man depraved and sickening go only so far. David Fuller murdered two women and sexually abused at least a hundred bodies in hospital mortuaries. So heinous his crimes, the health secretary announced an inquiry to ensure it's never allowed to happen again. It will help us understand how these offences took place without detection in the trust. Identify any areas where early action by this trust was necessary and then consider wider national issues, including for the NHS. The hospital electrician managed to access mortuaries once staff had gone home in two Kent hospitals. It looks like he's got some hard drives in there, I would say. He filmed his appalling acts and kept the videos on hard drive, along with millions of other offensive images. Fuller's youngest victim was nine, the oldest, a hundred. I want to apologise to the friends and families of all the victims for the crimes that were perpetrated in the care of the NHS and for the hurt and suffering they are feeling. 81 of the victims have been formally identified and their families must now live with the horror of what happened after they died. Those who called for an inquiry say comprehending that could take years. I think what's important for them is to have some of their questions answered and that will come through the independent inquiry. Uncovering these crimes have been really horrific to come to terms with, but we can't be here again. This has to be the last time something this awful can happen. Trying to understand how Fuller committed his crimes might now finally be revealed, but why he did it, we may never know. Emily Morgan, ITV News. Yorkshire County Cricket Club's new chairman has called for seismic change following the Azim Rafiq racism allegations. Lord Patel apologised to the former player for how the club had handled his claims. And revealing his own experience of racism, he said the type of abuse directed at Rafiq is never banter. With more, here's our sports editor Steve Scott from Headingley. Lord Patel, the man charged with tackling a crisis that's revealed a dark and ugly side to cricket's most famous county, costing its sponsors, international matches and, most significantly, its reputation. There's a clear need for a urgent and seismic change, starting from within. And I'm determined to lead this club to a better and more positive future. Patel's first decisive move to settle an employment tribunal with Azim Rafiq, the former player whose allegations have brought the club to its knees. He's been compensated and is free to talk publicly about his experiences. Why would we do this to any human being? You know, he's played here, he was the captain here. It would be a shame 
not to work together uh, and to seek his help to find a way forward. In a statement today, Rafiq described his settlement as a start, but also urged two senior executives and many on the current coaching staff to quit to make way for change. This is me as a, as a fresh-faced 14-year-old. Tabasum Batty is another former player who claims he suffered racist abuse. Part of Yorkshire's academy in the late 90s, he told ITV News today he was targeted by teammates on a near daily basis. Things really need to change. And I've got young children, I've got a young boy who's six, I've got a girl who's two. Would I want them to experience what me and Azim have been through? And other players that have come forward and I've experienced, do I want them to go through that? No. Would I want my children to be affiliated with Yorkshire County Cricket Club? Definitely not. Lord Patel is clearly passionate about the task ahead, but by his own admission today, his inbox is rammed. And he only has a limited amount of time to rescue this club, both reputationally and financially. Yorkshire will hope today signals a turning point. It may well prove that way. But given the full details of its investigation are yet to be made public, there are still very difficult days ahead. Steve Scott, ITV News, Headingley. A teenager has been sentenced to at least 17 years in jail for the murder of a 12-year-old boy. Robert Buncis died after being stabbed more than 70 times in Boston in Lincolnshire last December. Today, Marcel Grisesh, who's now 15, was sentenced for the murder and a court order was lifted, allowing him to be identified. Lincolnshire police said the case was one of the saddest they'd ever dealt with. Now, a team of more than 200 people has been working around the clock to rescue a man trapped in Britain's deepest caves. He was injured in a fall on Saturday while exploring the cave system in the Brecon Beacons, which is more than 30 miles long from the scene. Here's Ben Chapman. It is a painstaking operation that has been steadily growing in scale for the past two days. Now, more than 250 rescuers working day and night to free a man trapped in one of Britain's largest caves. A mission made all the more difficult by the conditions inside and his injuries. It's a long way. Um, he's having to be traversed through the cave to what we call the top entrance, which is about a kilometre from where we're standing up the mountain. Um, so a kilometre in a straight line, well, we, we could walk there in a few minutes, but it's not a kilometre in a straight line. It's a twisty, turny passages, variety of terrain. This training exercise, filmed in the same cave, provides an insight into its terrain and the challenges it presents. It can take hours or days to carry a stretcher out. A physical and demanding task for those who've been involved in this operation. It takes time, we have to think about it, we have to plan it. You need people, you need experienced people who, who, who can deal with the conditions and look after themselves as well, because you're still in that challenging environment. So there's a whole raft of factors that come into play. This is an experienced team. Some of those leading it helped save 12 young Thai footballers and their coach from flooded caves three years ago. The entrance, it, it's pretty grim. Now their focus in the Brecon Beacons, is bringing safely to the surface a man who's now been underground for more than two days. This is where the operation is being coordinated. Rescuers say the injured man is in his 40s. He's an experienced caver. Um, we're told uh, that his injuries uh, are multiple, but they are not life-threatening. And perhaps surprisingly, he is said to be in good spirits. Now, the latest is that he's been brought quite close now to the exit of the cave, close enough for medics to be able to get to him. And we're told he may finally be out of there within the next couple of hours. OK, Ben Chapman in the Brecon Beacons, thank you. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, the British man killed in a shark attack in Australia. And America's borders reopen for family reunions and transatlantic holidays. Those stories and more after the break. Join me then.
Hello again, welcome back. The wife of a man killed in a shark attack off a beach in Australia has described him as a wonderful father. Except for a pair of swimming goggles, rescue teams have found no trace of 57-year-old Paul Millichip, who was originally from the UK. Dan Rivers has the story. After two days of searching for his body by sea and air, the authorities finally called off their recovery operations, knowing there was now little hope of finding 57-year-old Paul Millerchip. The British father of two had been attacked by a 14-foot great white in front of his horrified wife and children. This amateur footage taken just after shows the fin of the shark still circling and a dinghy piloted by local teenagers warning swimmers to get out of the water. Mr Millerchip's wife, who didn't want to be named, bravely paid tribute to her husband. Rest in peace, Paul. He, he died what he was, what he was enjoyed doing the most, which was exercising. The children who faced down a shark bigger than their boat witnessed the gruesome attack close up. The dinghies were there trying to like get the body into the boat. They obviously couldn't because the shark kept going at it. This is the third fatal shark attack this year in Australia. Experts say warming oceans are making endangered shark species stray further for prey. Their numbers are declining. So whilst we're seeing this increase, I think this increase is a sign of their stress levels um, and for, of the dangers and the difficulties that these guys are facing out in the wild um, and not an increase of aggression. Shark attacks are still relatively rare. But this one involving a great white so near the centre of Perth has left many locals shocked and asking questions about whether man's damage to the planet is making these encounters more likely. Dan Rivers, ITV News. Yeah, more than a million people have signed up to receive a COVID booster vaccine after eligibility rules were changed. From today, those aged 50 and over, plus those most at risk, can book an appointment five months after their second dose. It means they could receive their booster six months after being fully vaccinated. Now separated by an ocean and a pandemic for more than 600 days, thousands of people jetted off to the United States today for long-awaited reunions. US borders have finally reopened to fully vaccinated visitors from the UK. And as Chloe Keedy reports, spirits were sky high as passengers and airlines toasted the return of transatlantic travel. At 8.51 a.m. on parallel runways at Heathrow Airport, a rare show of unity from two of aviation's biggest rivals. For Virgin Atlantic and British Airways, this stunt was a way of celebrating the reopening of America's borders. As they took off for New York, excitement was also building in Terminal 3. Many of these passengers about to make a journey they've been waiting for for almost two years. We're going to Orlando. Um, we go a lot and we love it and we've really missed it. My sister lives there and I haven't, we haven't actually met her since 2019. So really excited to go there today. We've been waiting for a big family holiday for about two years. We're trying to get it organised now. So uh, yeah, just really excited because it's been cancelled and postponed so many times. But for anyone wanting to travel, there are a few rules. Adults have to be fully vaccinated and take a private COVID test no more than three days before leaving or show proof you've had the virus in the last three months. Children under 18 don't need to be vaccinated, but must take a test before and after arrival. And when you get home, you'll have to take a test two days after you land. We are open! New York is eager to welcome tourists back, but for a range of indoor activities, including going to the theatre, to a gig or a restaurant, anyone over 12 will have to prove they've had at least one dose of the vaccine. Restrictions vary from state to state. Going on holiday isn't as straightforward as it was. But the resumption of transatlantic travel is a big moment for the airline business, which will be hoping that today's takeoff serves as a metaphor for the industry's direction of travel. Chloe Keedy, ITV News. And finally, she is the bookie's favourite to dance her way to the Strictly Glitterball trophy, but Rose Ailing Ellis is doing far more than just entertaining the nation. Charities have given the show's first deaf contestant a perfect score after she prompted a big increase in people wanting to learn British Sign Language. Sejal Karia reports.
Sometimes I love you. Rose Ailing Ellis may be blazing a trail on Strictly's dance floor as the show's first deaf contestant, but she is also breaking down barriers off it, inspiring a huge surge of fans to learn British Sign Language, with a staggering 3,000% increase in people signing up just this weekend. It's brilliant. I mean, the, the visits that we've got to our website and people who are interested in learning um, has gone through the roof. Um, and I think for me as well, to see Rose signing um, during dancing, but also to see her partner Giovanni signing and learning alongside her and embracing the language and the culture, it, it's fantastic. It really does give us a real boost. Rose Amy Ellis and Giovanni Bonici. The children at Heathland School in St Albans have been following Rose's progress and hope more people learning to sign will mean less isolation for deaf people. We'd really like to see BSL spread much wider and really would love to see it included in schools as part of GCSE. Fab, you love. So Rose is helping to dismantle stereotypes as well as barriers between languages. Sejal Karia, ITV News. And that is all for now. Tom's here at 10 from me and all the team. Bye-bye.